Welcome once again to Horror Babble. Today I will be reading the wonderful work of collaborative fiction, The Challenge from Beyond, by C. L. Moore, A. Merritt, H. P. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, and Frank Belknap Long. I hope you enjoy it. The Challenge from Beyond George Campbell opened sleep-fogged eyes upon darkness and lay gazing out at the tent flap upon the pale August night for some minutes before he roused enough even to wonder what had wakened him. There was in the keen, clear air of these Canadian woods a soporific as potent as any drug. Campbell lay quiet for a moment, sinking slowly back into the delicious borderlands of sleep, conscious of an exquisite weariness, an unaccustomed sense of muscles well used, and relaxed now into perfect ease. These were vacation's most delightful moments, after all, rest after toil in the clear, sweet forest night. Luxuriously, as his mind sank backward into oblivion, he assured himself once more that three long months of freedom lay before him, freedom from cities and monotony, freedom from pedagogy, and the university and students, with no rudiments of interest in the geology he earned his daily bread by dinning into their obdurate ears, freedom from… Abruptly, the delightful somnolence crashed about him. Somewhere outside, the sound of tin shrieking across tin slashed into his peace. George Campbell sat up jerkily and reached for his flashlight. Then he laughed and put it down again, straining his eyes through the midnight gloom outside, where among the tumbling cans of his supplies a dark anonymous little night beast was prowling. He stretched out a long arm and groped about among the rocks at the tent door for a missile. His fingers closed on a large stone, and he drew back his hand to throw. But he never threw it. It was such a queer thing he had come upon in the dark, square, crystal smooth, obviously artificial, with dull, rounded corners. The strangeness of its rock surfaces to his fingers was so remarkable that he reached again for his flashlight and turned its rays upon the thing he held. All sleepiness left him as he saw what it was he had picked up in his idle groping. It was clear as rock crystal, this queer smooth cube, quartz unquestionably, but not in its usual hexagonal crystallized form. Somehow, he could not guess the method, it had been wrought into a perfect cube, about four inches in measurement over each worn face, for it was incredibly worn. The hard, hard crystal was rounded now until its corners were almost gone and the thing was beginning to assume the outlines of a sphere. Ages and ages of wearing, years almost beyond counting, must have passed over this strange clear thing. But the most curious thing of all was that shape he could make out dimly in the heart of the crystal, for embedded in its center lay a little disk of a pale and nameless substance with characters in size deep upon its quartz-enclosed surface, wedge-shaped characters faintly reminiscent of cuneiform writing. George Campbell wrinkled his brows and bent closer above the little enigma in his hands, puzzling helplessly. How could such a thing as this have embedded in pure rock crystal? Remotely, a memory floated through his mind of ancient legends that called quartz crystals ice, which had frozen too hard to melt again. Ice and wedge-shaped cuneiforms, yes. Didn't that sort of writing originate among the Sumerians who came down from the north in history's remotest beginnings to settle in the primitive Mesopotamian valley? Then hard sense regained control, and he laughed. Quartz, of course, was formed in the earliest of Earth's geological periods, when there was nothing anywhere but heat and heaving rock. Ice had not come for tens of millions of years after this thing must have been formed. And yet, that writing, man-made surely, although its characters were unfamiliar save in their faint hinting at cuneiform shapes. Or could there, in a Paleozoic world, have been things with a written language who might have graven these cryptic wedges upon the quartz-enveloped disk he held? Or might a thing like this have fallen meteor-like out of space into the unformed rock of a still molten world? Could it? Then he caught himself up sharply, and felt his ears going hot at the luridness of his own imagination. 
The silence and the solitude and the queer thing in his hands were conspiring to play tricks with his common sense. He shrugged and laid the crystal down at the edge of his palette, switching off the light. Perhaps morning and a clear head would bring him an answer to the questions that seemed so insoluble now. But sleep did not come easily. For one thing, it seemed to him as he flashed off the light that the little cube had shone for a moment, as if with sustained light before it faded into the surrounding dark. Or perhaps he was wrong. Perhaps it had been only his dazzled eyes that seemed to see the light forsake it reluctantly, glowing in the enigmatic deeps of the thing with queer persistence. He lay there unquietly for a long while, turning the unanswered questions over and over in his mind. There was something about this crystal cube out of the unmeasured past, perhaps from the dawn of all history, that constituted a challenge that would not let him sleep. He lay there, it seemed to him, for hours. It had been the lingering light, the luminescence that seemed so reluctant to die, which held his mind. It was as though something in the heart of the cube had awakened, stirred drowsily, become suddenly alert, and intent upon him. Sheer fantasy, this. He stirred impatiently and flashed his light upon his watch, close to one o'clock, three hours more before the dawn. The beam fell and was focused upon the warm crystal cube. He held it there closely for minutes. He snapped it out, then watched. There was no doubt about it now. As his eyes accustomed themselves to the darkness, he saw that the strange crystal was glimmering with tiny fugitive lights deep within it like threads of sapphire lightnings. They were at its center, and they seemed to him to come from the pale disk with its disturbing markings. And the disk itself was becoming larger. The markings shifting shapes, the cube was growing. Was it illusion brought about by the tiny lightnings? He heard a sound. It was the very ghost of a sound, like the ghosts of harp strings being plucked with ghostly fingers. He bent closer. It came from the cube. There was squeaking in the underbrush, a flurry of bodies and an agonized wailing like a child in death throes, and swiftly stilled. Some small tragedy of the wilderness, killer, and prey. He stepped over to where it had been enacted, but could see nothing. He again snapped off the flash and looked toward his tent. Upon the ground was a pale blue glimmering. It was the cube. He stooped to pick it up, then, obeying some obscure warning, drew back his hand. And again, he saw its glow was dying. The tiny sapphire lightnings flashing fitfully, withdrawing to the disk from which they had come. There was no sound from it. He sat, watching the luminescence glow and fade, glow and fade, but steadily becoming dimmer. It came to him that two elements were necessary to produce the phenomenon. The electric ray itself, and his own fixed attention. His mind must travel along the ray, fix itself upon the cube's heart, if its beat were to wax until… what? He felt a chill of spirit, as though from contact with some alien thing. It was alien, he knew it, not of this earth, not of earth's life. He conquered his shrinking, picked up the cube and took it into the tent. It was neither warm nor cold, except for its weight he would not have known he held it. He put it upon the table, keeping the torch turned from it, then stepped to the flap of the tent and closed it. He went back to the table, drew up the camp chair, and turned the flash directly upon the cube, focusing it so far as he could upon its heart. He sent all his will, all his concentration along it, focusing will and sight upon the disk as he had the light. As though at command, the sapphire lightnings burned forth. They burst from the disk into the body of the crystal cube, then beat back, bathing the disk and the markings. Again these began to change, shifting, moving, advancing, and retreating in the blue gleaming. They were no longer cuneiform. They were things, objects. He heard the murmuring music, the plucked harp strings, Louder grew the sound, and louder, and now all the body of the cube vibrated to their rhythm. The crystal walls were melting, growing misty as though formed of the mist of diamonds, and the disk itself was growing, the shape shifting, dividing, and multiplying as though some door had been opened, and into it companies of phantasms were pouring. While brighter, more bright grew the pulsing light. He felt swift panic, 
tried to withdraw sight and will, dropped the flash. The cube had no need now of the ray, and he could not withdraw, could not withdraw. Why, he himself was being sucked into that disk, which was now a globe within which unnameable shapes danced to a music that bathed the globe with steady radiance. There was no tent. There was only a vast curtain of sparkling mist behind which shone the globe. He felt himself drawn through the mist, sucked through it as if by a mighty wind, straight for the globe. As the mist-blowed light of the sapphire suns grew more and more intense, the outlines of the globe ahead wavered and dissolved to a churning chaos. Its pallor and its motion and its music all blended themselves with the engulfing mist, bleaching it to a pale steel color and setting it undulantly in motion. And the sapphire suns, too, melted imperceptibly into the graying infinity of shapeless pulsation. Meanwhile, the sense of forward, outward motion grew intolerably, incredibly, cosmically swift. Every standard of speed known to Earth seemed dwarfed, and Campbell knew that any such flight in physical reality would mean instant death to a human being, even as it was in this strange hellish hypnosis or nightmare, the quasi-visual impression of meteor-like hurtling almost paralyzed his mind. Though there were no real points of reference in the grey, pulsing void, he felt that he was approaching and passing the speed of light itself. Finally, his consciousness did go under, and merciful blackness swallowed everything. It was very suddenly, and amidst the most impenetrable darkness, that thoughts and ideas again came to George Campbell. Of how many moments, or years, or eternities, had elapsed since his flight through the grey void, he could form no estimate. He knew only that he seemed to be at rest, and without pain. Indeed, the absence of all physical sensation was the salient quality of his condition. It made even the blackness seem less solidly black, suggesting as it did that he was rather a disembodied intelligence in a state beyond physical senses than a corporeal being with senses deprived of their accustomed objects of perception. He could think sharply and quickly, almost preternaturally so, yet could form no idea whatsoever of his situation. Half by instinct, he realized that he was not in his own tent. True, he might have awaked there from a nightmare to a world equally black, yet he knew this was not so. There was no camp cot beneath him. He had no hands to feel the blankets and canvas surface and flashlight that ought to be around him. There was no sensation of cold in the air, no flap through which he could glimpse the pale night outside. Something was wrong, dreadfully wrong. He cast his mind backward, and thought of the fluorescent cube which had hypnotized him, of that and all which had followed. He had known that his mind was going, yet had been unable to draw back. At the last moment, there had been a shocking panic fear, a subconscious fear beyond even that caused by the sensation of demonic flight. It had come from some vague flash or remote recollection, just what he could not at once tell. Some cell group in the back of his head had seemed to find a cloudily familiar quality in the cube, and that familiarity was fraught with dim terror. Now he tried to remember what the familiarity and the terror were. Little by little, it came to him. Once, long ago, in connection with his geological life work, he had read of something like that cube, it had to do with those debatable and disquieting clay fragments called the Elkdown Shards, dug up from pre-carboniferous strata in southern England thirty years before. Their shape and markings were so queer that a few scholars hinted at artificiality and made wild conjectures about them and their origin. They came, clearly, from a time when no human beings could exist on the globe, but their contours and figurings were damnably puzzling. That was how they got their name. It was not, however, in the writings of any sober scientist that Campbell had seen that reference to a crystal, disc-holding globe. The source was far less reputable and infinitely more vivid. About 1912, a deeply learned Sussex clergyman of occultist leanings, the Reverend Arthur Brooke Winters Hall, had professed to identify the markings on the Eltdown shards with some of the so-called pre-human hieroglyphs persistently cherished and esoterically handed down in certain mystical circles, 
and had published, at his own expense, what purported to be a translation of the primal and baffling inscriptions, a translation still quoted frequently and seriously by occult writers. In this translation, a surprisingly long brochure, in view of the limited number of shards existing, had occurred the narrative, supposedly of pre-human authorship, containing the now frightening reference. As the story went, there dwelt on a world, and eventually on countless other worlds, of outer space a mighty order of worm-like beings, whose attainments and whose control of nature surpassed anything within the range of terrestrial imagination. They had mastered the art of interstellar travel early in their career, and had peopled every habitable planet in their own galaxy, killing off the races they found. Beyond the limits of their own galaxy, which was not ours, they could not navigate in person, but in their quest for knowledge of all space and time, they discovered a means of spanning certain transgalactic gulfs with their minds. They devised peculiar objects, strangely energized cubes of a curious crystal containing hypnotic talisman, and enclosed in space-resisting spherical envelopes of an unknown substance, which could be forcibly expelled beyond the limits of their universe, and which would respond to the attraction of cool, solid matter only. These, of which a few would necessarily land on various inhabited worlds in outside universes, form the ether bridges needed for mental communication. Atmospheric friction burned away the protecting envelope, leaving the cube exposed and subject to discovery by the intelligent minds of the world where it fell. By its very nature, the cube would attract and rivet attention. This, when coupled with the action of light, was sufficient to set its special properties working. The mind that noticed the cube would be drawn into it by the power of the disk, and would be sent on a thread of obscure energy to the place whence the disk had come, the remote world of the worm-like space explorers across stupendous galactic abysses. Received in one of the machines to which each cube was attuned, the captured mind would remain suspended without body or senses until examined by one of the dominant race. Then it would, by an obscure process of interchange, be pumped of all its contents. The investigator's mind would now occupy the strange machine, while the captive mind occupied the interrogator's worm-like body. Then, in another interchange, the interrogator's mind would leap across boundless space to the captive's vacant and unconscious body on the transgalactic world, animating the alien tenement as best it might, and exploring the alien world in the guise of one of its denizens. When done with exploration, the adventurer would use the cube and its disk in accomplishing his return, and sometimes the captured mind would be restored safely to its own remote world. Not always, however, was the dominant race so kind. Sometimes, when a potentially important race capable of space travel was found, the worm-like folk would employ the cube to capture and annihilate minds by the thousands, and would extirpate the race for diplomatic reasons, using the exploring minds as agents of destruction. In other cases, sections of the worm folk would permanently occupy a transgalactic planet, destroying the captured minds and wiping out the remaining inhabitants preparatory to settling down in unfamiliar bodies. Never, however, could the parent civilization be quite duplicated in such a case, since the new planet would not contain all the materials necessary for the worm race's arts. The cubes, for example, could be made only on the home planet. Only a few of the numberless cubes sent forth ever found a landing and response on an inhabited world, since there was no such thing as aiming them at goals beyond sight or knowledge. Only three, ran the story, had ever landed on peopled worlds in our own particular universe. One of these had struck a planet near the galactic rim two thousand billion years ago, while another had lodged three billion years ago on a world near the center of the galaxy. The third, and the only one ever known to have invaded the solar system, had reached our own Earth one hundred and fifty million years ago. It was with this latter that Dr. Winters Hall's translation chiefly dealt. When the cube struck the Earth, he wrote, the ruling terrestrial species was a huge, cone-shaped race, surpassing all others before or since in mentality and achievements. This race was so advanced that it had actually sent minds abroad in both space and time to explore the cosmos, hence recognize something of what had happened 
when the cube fell from the sky and certain individuals had suffered mental change after gazing at it. Realizing that the changed individuals represented invading minds, the race's leaders had them destroyed, even at the cost of leaving the displaced minds exiled in alien space. They had had experience with even stranger transitions. When, through a mental exploration of space and time, they formed a rough idea of what the cube was, they carefully hid the thing from light and sight, and guarded it as a menace. They did not wish to destroy a thing so rich in later experimental possibilities. Now and then, some rash, unscrupulous adventurer would furtively gain access to it and sample its perilous powers despite the consequences, but all such cases were discovered and safely and drastically dealt with. Of this evil meddling, the only bad result was that the worm-like outside race learned from the new exiles what had happened to their explorers on Earth, and conceived a violent hatred of the planet and all its life-forms. They would have depopulated it if they could, and indeed sent additional cubes into space in the wild hope of striking it by accident in unguarded places, but that accident never came to pass. The cone-shaped terrestrial beings kept the one existing cube in a special shrine as a relic and basis for experiments, till after aeons it was lost amidst the chaos of war and the destruction of the great polar city where it was guarded, when, fifty million years ago, the beings sent their minds ahead into the infinite future to avoid a nameless peril of inner earth, the whereabouts of the sinister cube from space were unknown. This much, according to the learned occultist, the Eltdown Shards had said. What now made the account so obscurely frightful to Campbell was the minute accuracy with which the alien cube had been described. Every detail tallied, dimensions, consistency, hieroglyph, central disk, hypnotic effects. As he thought the matter over and over amidst the darkness of his strange situation, he began to wonder whether his whole experience with the crystal cube, indeed its very existence, were not a nightmare brought on by some freakish, subconscious memory of this old bit of extravagant, charlatanic reading. If so, though, the nightmare must still be in force, since his present apparently bodiless state had nothing of normality in it. Of the time consumed by this puzzled memory and reflection, Campbell could form no estimate. Everything about his state was so unreal that ordinary dimensions and measurements became meaningless. It seemed an eternity, but perhaps it was not really long before the sudden interruption came. What happened was as strange and inexplicable as the blackness it succeeded. There was a sensation of the mind rather than of the body, and all at once Campbell felt his thoughts swept or sucked beyond his control in tumultuous and chaotic fashion. Memories arose irresponsibly and irrelevantly. All that he knew, all his personal background, traditions, experiences, scholarship, dreams, ideas, and inspirations welled up abruptly and simultaneously with a dizzying speed and abundance which soon made him unable to keep track of any separate concept. The parade of all his mental contents became an avalanche, a cascade, a vortex. It was as horrible and vertiginous as his hypnotic flight through space when the crystal cube pulled him. Finally, it sapped his consciousness and brought on fresh oblivion. Another measureless blank, and then a slow trickle of sensation. This time it was physical, not mental. Sapphire light, and a low rumble of distant sound. There were tactile impressions. He could realize that he was lying at full length on something, though there was a baffling strangeness about the feel of his posture. He could not reconcile the pressure of the supporting surface with his own outlines, or with the outlines of the human form at all. He tried to move his arms, but found no definite response to the attempt. Instead, there were little, ineffectual, nervous twitches all over the area which seemed to mark his body. He tried to open his eyes more widely, but found himself unable to control their mechanism. The sapphire light came in a diffused, nebulous manner, and could nowhere be voluntarily focused into definiteness. Gradually, though, visual images began to trickle in curiously and indecisively. The limits and qualities of vision were not those which he was used to, but he could roughly correlate the sensation with what he had known as sight. 
As this sensation gained some degree of stability, Campbell realized that he must still be in the throes of nightmare. He seemed to be in a room of considerable extent, of medium height, but with a large proportionate area on every side, and he could apparently see all four sides at once, were high, narrowish slits which seemed to serve as combined doors and windows. There were singular low tables or pedestals, but no furniture of normal nature and proportions. Through the slits streamed floods of sapphire light, and beyond them could be mistily seen the sides and roofs of fantastic buildings like clustered cubes. On the walls, in the vertical panels between the slits, were strange markings of an oddly disquieting character. It was some time before Campbell understood why they disturbed him so. Then he saw that they were, in repeated instances, precisely like some of the hieroglyphs on the crystal cube's disk. The actual nightmare element, though, was something more than this. It began with a living thing which presently entered through one of the slits, advancing deliberately toward him and bearing a metal box of bizarre proportions and glassy, mirror-like surfaces. For this thing was nothing human, nothing of earth, nothing even of man's myths and dreams. It was a gigantic, pale grey worm or centipede, as large around as a man and twice as long, with a disc-like, apparently eyeless, cilia-fringed head bearing a purple central orifice. It glided on its rear pairs of legs, with its forepart raised vertically, the legs, or at least two pairs of them, serving as arms. Along its spinal ridge was a curious purple comb, and a fan-shaped tail of some grey membrane ended its grotesque bulk. There was a ring of flexible red spikes around its neck, and from the twistings of these came clicking, twanging sounds in measured, deliberate rhythms. Here, indeed, was Outre Nightmare at its height, capricious fantasy at its apex. But even the vision of delirium was not what caused George Campbell to lapse a third time into unconsciousness. It took one more thing, one final unbearable touch, to do that. As the nameless worm advanced with its glistening box, the reclining man caught in the mirror-like surface a glimpse of what should have been his own body. Yet, horribly verifying his disordered and unfamiliar sensations, it was not his own body at all that he saw reflected in the burnished metal. It was, instead, the loathsome, pale grey bulk of one of the great centipedes. From that final lap of senselessness, he emerged with a full understanding of his situation. His mind was imprisoned in the body of a frightful native of an alien planet, while somewhere on the other side of the universe, his own body was housing the monster's personality. He fought down an unreasoning horror. Judged from a cosmic standpoint, why should his metamorphosis horrify him? Life and consciousness were the only realities in the universe. Form was unimportant. His present body was hideous only according to terrestrial standards. Fear and revulsion were drowned in the excitement of titanic adventure. What was his former body but a cloak, eventually to be cast off at death anyway? He had no sentimental illusions about the life from which he had been exiled. What had it ever given him, save toil, poverty, continual frustration, and repression? If this life before him offered no more, at least it offered no less. Intuition told him it offered more, much more. With the honesty possible only when life is stripped to its naked fundamentals, he realized that he remembered with pleasure only the physical delights of his former life. But he had long ago exhausted all the physical possibilities contained in that earthly body. Earth held no new thrills, but in the possession of this new, alien body, he felt promises of strange, exotic joys. A lawless exultation rose in him. He was a man without a world, free of all conventions or inhibitions of Earth, or of this strange planet, free of every artificial restraint in the universe. He was a god. With grim amusement, he thought of his body moving in Earth's business and society, with all the while an alien monster staring out of the windows that were George Campbell's eyes on people who would flee if they knew. Let him walk the Earth, slaying and destroying as he would. Earth and its races no longer had any meaning to George Campbell. There he had been one of a billion non-entities, fixed in place by a mountainous accumulation of conventions, laws, and manners, doomed to live and die in his sordid niche. 
but in one blind bound he had soared above the commonplace. This was not death, but rebirth, the birth of a full-grown mentality with a newfound freedom that made little of physical captivity on Yakub. He started. Yakub. It was the name of this planet. But how had he known? Then he knew, as he knew the name of him whose body he occupied, Toth. Memory, deep-grooved in Toth's brain, was stirring in him shadows of the knowledge Toth had. Carved deep in the physical tissues of the brain, they spoke dimly as implanted instincts to George Campbell, and as human consciousness seized them and translated them to show him the way not only to safety and freedom, but to the power his soul, stripped to its primitive impulses, craved. Not as a slave would he dwell on your cub, but as a king, just as of old barbarians had sat on the throne of lordly empires. For the first time, he turned his attention to his surroundings. He still lay on the couch-like thing in the midst of that fantastic room, and the centipede man stood before him, holding the polished metal object and clashing its neck spikes. Thus it spoke to him, Gamble knew, and what it said he dimly understood, through the implanted thought processes of Toth, just as he knew the creature was Yakth, supreme lord of science. But Campbell gave no heed, for he had made his desperate plan, a plan so alien to the ways of Yakub, that it was beyond Yakth's comprehension, and caught him wholly unprepared. Yakth, like Campbell, saw the sharp-pointed metal shard on a nearby table, but to Yakth it was only a scientific implement. He did not even know it could be used as a weapon. Campbell's earthly mind supplied the knowledge and the action that followed, driving Toth's body into movements no man of Yakub had ever made before. Campbell snatched the pointed shard and struck, ripping savagely upward. Yakth reared and toppled, his entrails spilling on the floor. In an instant, Campbell was streaking for a door. His speed was amazing, exhilarating, first fulfillment of the promise of novel physical sensations. As he ran, guided wholly by the instinctive knowledge implanted in Toth's physical reflexes, it was as if he were borne by a separate consciousness in his legs. Toth's body was bearing him along a route it had traversed ten thousand times when animated by Toth's mind. Down a winding corridor he raced, up a twisted stair, through a carved door, and the same instincts that had brought him there told him he had found what he sought. He was in a circular room, with a domed roof from which shone a livid blue light. A strange structure rose in the middle of the rainbow-hued floor, tier on tier, each of a separate, vivid color. The ultimate tier was a purple cone, from the apex of which a blue, smoky mist drifted upward to a sphere that poised in mid-air, a sphere that shone like translucent ivory. This, the deep-grooved memories of Toth told Campbell, was the god of Yakub, though why the people of Yakub feared and worshipped it had been forgotten a million years. A worm priest stood between him and the altar, which no hand of flesh had ever touched. That it could be touched was a blasphemy that had never occurred to a man of Yakub. The worm priest stood in frozen horror until Campbell's shard ripped the life out of him. On his centipede legs, Campbell clambered the tiered altar, heedless of its sudden quiverings, heedless of the change that was taking place in the floating sphere, heedless of the smoke that now billowed out in blue clouds. He was drunk with the feel of power. He feared the superstitions of Yakub no more than he feared those of Earth. With that globe in his hands, he would be king of Yakub. The worm men would dare deny him nothing when he held their goddess hostage. He reached a hand for the ball, no longer ivory-hued, but red as blood. Out of the tent into the pale August night walked the body of George Campbell. It moved with a slow, wavering gait between the bodies of enormous trees over a forest path strewed with sweet-scented pine needles. The air was crisp and cold. The sky was an inverted bowl of frosted silver flecked with stardust, and far to the north the aurora borealis splashed streamers of fire. The head of the walking man lolled hideously from side to side. From the corners of his lax mouth drooled thick threads of amber froth which fluttered in the night breeze. He walked upright at first, as a man would walk, but gradually as the tent receded, his posture altered. His torso began almost imperceptibly to slant, and his limbs to shorten. 
In a far-off world of outer space, the centipede creature that was George Campbell clasped to its bosom a god whose lineaments were red as blood, and ran with insect-like quiverings across a rainbow-hued hole and out through massive portals into the bright glow of alien suns. Weaving between the trees of earth in an attitude that suggested the awkward loping of a werebeast, the body of George Campbell was fulfilling a mindless destiny. Long, claw-tipped fingers dragged leaves from a carpet of odorous pine needles as it moved toward a wide expanse of gleaming water. In the far-off, extra-galactic world of the Worm People, George Campbell moved between cyclopean blocks of black masonry down long, fern-planted avenues holding aloft the round red god. There was a harsh animal cry in the underbrush near the gleaming lake on Earth, where the mind of a worm creature dwelt in a body swayed by instinct. Human teeth sank into soft animal fur, tore at black animal flesh. A little silver fox sank its fangs in frantic retaliation into a furry human wrist, and thrashed about in terror as its blood spurted. Slowly, the body of George Campbell arose, its mouth splashed with fresh blood. With upper limbs swaying oddly, it moved towards the waters of the lake. As the very formed creature that was George Campbell crawled between the black blocks of stone, thousands of worm shapes prostrated themselves in the scintillating dust before it. A godlike power seemed to emanate from its weaving body as it moved with a slow, undulant motion toward a throne of spiritual empire transcending all the sovereignties of Earth. A trapper, stumbling wearily through the dense woods of Earth near the tent where the worm creature dwelt in the body of George Campbell, came to the gleaming waters of the lake and discerned something dark floating there. He had been lost in the woods all night, and weariness enveloped him like a leaden cloak in the pale morning light. But the shape was a challenge that he could not ignore. Moving to the edge of the water, he knelt in the soft mud and reached out toward the floating bulk. Softly, he pulled it to the shore. Far off in outer space, the worm creature holding the glowing red god ascended a throne that gleamed like the constellation Cassiopeia under an alien vault of hypersuns. The great deity that he held aloft energized his worm tenement, burning away in the white fire of a supermundane spirituality all animal dross. On earth, the trapper gazed with unutterable horror into the blackened and hairy face of the drowned man. It was a bestial face, repulsively anthropoid in contour, and from its twisted, distorted mouth, black ichor poured. He who sought your body in the abysses of time will occupy an unresponsive tenement, said the red god. No spawn of your cub can control the body of a human. On all earth, living creatures rend one another, and feast with unutterable cruelty on their kith and kin. No worm mind can control a bestial man-body when it yearns to raven. Only man-minds, instinctively conditioned through the course of ten thousand generations, can keep the human instincts in thrall. Your body will destroy itself on earth, seeking the blood of its animal kin, seeking the cool water where it can wallow at its ease. Seeking eventually destruction, for the death instinct is more powerful in it than the instincts of life, and it will destroy itself in seeking to return to the slime from which it sprang. Thus spoke the round red god of Yakub in a far-off segment of the space-time continuum to George Campbell, as the latter, with all human desire purged away, sat on a throne and ruled an empire of worms more wisely, kindly, and benevolently than any man of earth had ever ruled an empire of men. Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this reading, feel free to follow the links on screen to other readings here at Horror Babble. Until next time.